Welcome everybody to another lecture of the Elements of Sustainability series. Today, we are pleased to have Professor Joe Arbai to talk about decision making and the triple bottom line. Dr. Arbai is the Max McGraw Professor of Sustainable Enterprise and the Director of the Earth Institute for Global Sustainable Enterprise at the University of Michigan. In addition to his position at U of M, he is a senior researcher at the Decision Science Research Institute in Eugene, Oregon, and an adjunct professor in engineering and public policy at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He is an internationally recognized expert in risk and decision sciences. In addition to Dr. Arbai's academic work, he's a former member of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency Charter Science Advisory Board, and he is a member of the U.S. National Academy of Science Board of em on Environmental Change and Society. We are very happy to have today uh, Professor Arbai. The floor is yours. Thanks everyone for, for tuning in and for being here in the audience, for those of you who are uh, in the live studio audience today. As Erica said, I'm Joe Arvai. I'm the uh, director of the Herb Institute at the University of Michigan, and I'm here to talk a little bit about the Triple Bottom Line. In particular, the title of my presentation is The Triple Bottom Line, An Owner's Manual. And with that, let's, um, let's jump right in. So the triple bottom line, for those of you who don't know, and I suspect that most people who are following business and sustainability do know, is a sustainability framework that's really born from the balanced scorecard methodology, which is an accounting methodology that corporations and uh, governments have used to account for a variety of attributes that are both social, environmental, and economic. The triple bottom line itself was coined by John Elkington in the mid-1990s. At the time, Elkington was the head of a nonprofit based in the UK called Sustainability. And John argued for the fact that the triple bottom line in business really should be about accounting for the full cost or benefit of doing business across three different bottom lines, which he termed the three Ps. The first one being planet, the second one being people, and the third one being profit or prosperity. If you think about the triple bottom line, it's actually gone mainstream since John Elkington talked about it in the mid-1990s. Its most recent iteration is in the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And if you think about it and look at those goals, 17 of them really account for people, planet, and prosperity in ways that if you followed the sustainability conversation when it first started in the 70s and the 80s, you might not have expected. And what's really interesting about this is that 10 of the UN Sustainable Development Goals really do focus on people, another four, focus on the economy, and really where sustainability began at the environment really only accounts for three of those sustainable development goals. There's a tremendous amount of overlap, of course, but nevertheless, it's really interesting to see how thinking about the triple bottom line has evolved. In my own research, one thing that I've noticed is that when we talk about triple bottom line at the intersection between business and sustainability, what we see a lot of is discussions that are both retrospective and narrative in nature, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a second. What we see less of is discussions about the triple bottom line that are both forward-looking and more strategic. So retrospective and narrative, what I mean really is building on this balanced scorecard idea, approaches to the triple bottom line that are based largely on accounting and reporting. So companies come in, they identify social and environmental performance metrics along with economic metrics, track those and report performance in you know, uh, quarterly or uh, every half year annual sustainability reports. And listen, I say this is easy in the, in the slide. Nothing is really easy, but of all the things that you could do at the, at the sustainability business intersection, this is really where the, the low bar seems to be these days. Still with retrospective and, uh, and narrative, some firms have uh, gone further and have included benchmarking into their triple bottom line frameworks. The GRI, the Global Reporting Initiative, is a great example of this. Firms can use the GRI to track and improve performance over time within their corporations and across organizations, really with the goal of improvement in mind. So you keep uh, track of where your competitors or your partners are, where you are at different points in time, always looking for ways to improve the sustainable business situation. And what we see coming out of this is a lot of conversation about win-win-win alternatives. Companies and organizations talking about how they're winning on the environment front, winning on the social side, and also winning on the economic side. And to do this, as you might imagine, is harder because you're now integrating your own sustainability reporting with that across a variety of other firms and sectors. What I think 
is the highest level of triple bottom line thinking is really to take it to the level of strategic decision making. And this is why we don't see a lot of this because it's actually super hard. Firms that are looking at strategic decision making at the triple bottom line are really looking at sustainability as a decision problem or as an opportunity. And what I mean by that is that firms are tying their metrics for sustainability to different strategic objectives within the firm. They're using those objectives to come up with and then evaluate multiple different courses of action within the organization. And they're being very explicit about trade-offs, prepared to leave money on the table in the name of sustainability, or on the, on the same hand, um, prepared to leave some environmental or social benefit on the table in return for economic performance when that's necessary. So it's not really a win-win-win narrative, but much more of a, a trade-off specific narrative. And as you can imagine, this is extremely hard to do both practically and philosophically. Now I don't want to give the impression that these three strategies are divorced from one another. They all go hand in hand. You can't do benchmarking if you haven't first done accounting and reporting, and you can't do strategic decision making if you haven't done benchmarking. So all of these different pieces have to fit together. It really comes down to whether or not a firm chooses to focus on one particular area or two, or if they choose to pull the whole package together under their triple bottom line framework. Now in one of the other seminars as part of this webinar series, you'll hear Professor Andy Hoffman talk about market transformation. Market transformation is really the idea that in order to make sustainability gains at the level that we really want to make them, we can no longer afford to simply be less unsustainable. We have to make large evolutionary leaps on the sustainability side. And I'm here to tell you from a triple bottom line standpoint that those large evolutionary systemic leaps aren't going to happen by accident. They're not going to happen in a vacuum. They are going to require strategic triple bottom line thinking where people really are wrestling with some very difficult trade-offs. So I see the, the market transformation conversation and this more systemic strategic triple bottom line conversation really going hand in glove. Now if we want to do that, and I'm going to argue for the rest of my presentation that we really do want to head in that direction, there are going to be at least three challenges that we're going to need to overcome. One is an institutional challenge, and this is going to be obstacles on accounting, reporting, and benchmarking. And these are going to persist regardless of how far you want to take your sustainability and triple bottom line methodology. There are going to be methodological challenges. How do you actually operationalize tools and techniques so that firms can use them on a regular basis and in a, uh, in a very sort of routinized way? And then there are obviously, uh, and most interesting to me, going to be limits to human cognition. Making decisions across different objectives where trade-offs are necessary is extraordinarily hard. Now, for the rest of my talk, I'm going to focus on the methodological challenges and the cognitive limitations. I think the institutional obstacles are significant, but I think that those are better handled by other speakers in the series. And when I talk about these limitations in human cognition and in methodology, I'm going to actually treat them in reverse order. Now what you're looking at, I hope you can um, see this, is um, the metaphor I use when I teach my class on human limitations. I'm interested in decision making as a scholar, how people actually make choices, and we all like to think that we can make choices in a way that's rational, that's internally consistent. In other words, we're making decisions that uh, meet our prioritized values. And in spite of our best efforts, we uh, struggle to do that. And what you're looking at is a mask of Charlie Chaplin spinning around in a circle, and you're seeing the mask side in front of you now, and now it's going to spin around to the part where you would stick your head in to wear the mask. And if you're like me, what you're going to observe is the mask spins in the opposite direction and now is concave, uh, sorry, convex again. So even though you know what you're supposed to be looking at, you can't help but see two convex Charlie Chaplin masks appearing. So you would like to think that you can see what's real, but your brain is getting in the way. And decision making is exactly the same. We would like to think that we're making choices that are in our best interests, that are aligned with our prioritized values. But it's really hard to do that because there's a lot of cognitive machinery that trips us up. And I'm going to talk about a few examples of that that go above and beyond Charlie Chaplin spinning on a stick now. The first example I want to talk about is how we have a hard time making trade-offs. If you want to make triple bottom line decisions, you're going to have to wrestle with balancing social, economic, and environmental goals. And we've done a lot of research in my research group that's focused on how people confront these trade-offs. And in particular, do people really look at the ratio between cost and benefit when they make trade-offs? Or do they look at some other cue to help them inform that choice? 
And this is actually work that was done in the forestry sector. This was with people who are making decisions about wildfire management, but the context applies to anything uh, uh, that's out there that requires a cost-benefit trade-off. And what you're really seeing is a relationship between increasing risk now, that's the red line, and decreasing risk later. So if you imagine people who are worried about forest fire risk, one thing you could do to reduce the risk of a forest fire in the future is burn off all of the fuel that's on the ground today. If you burn off that fuel today in a controlled manner, there's less fuel left over for an accidental lightning strike or for an arsonist to light and cause a catastrophic fire in the future. You can ramp up the degree to which you're aggressive in burning off that fuel today. And the more aggressive you are today, you travel up that red line. You incur more risk today with a hotter fire to burn off that fuel. In return for that, you travel down the blue line over the future course. So in other words, as you take a more aggressive course of action today, you reduce the risk in the future because less fuel is available. And you can present this as a choice to people by saying, how aggressive do you want to be today in return for some benefit in the future? And you could pick either the status quo on the far left of this graph or any one of 10 options. And what we tell people is when you make this choice, think carefully about the ratio between cost and benefit. Another group of people, and these are all people who live and work in these urban wildfire interfaces, are shown this profile. And what you'll immediately notice is it's exactly the same profile as above, but it's just sawed off at option seven. And we've contained or we've compressed 10 alternatives into that space. And we basically ask people to make a choice between risk and benefit in this situation. And a third different group of people sees this profile, which again is now the first profile sawed off at option four. And people are asked to make a trade-off between risk and benefit here. If people were to make a trade-off that really accounted for risk and benefit, you would expect a lot of similarity in the degree between or the ratio between risk and benefit for each of the three alternatives. So option seven, for instance, if you pick that in panel one, you would expect people to pick option 10 in panel two and at least option 10 in panel three because that's the one that most closely approximates that ratio. And what we see instead is that people pick option five in all cases. And we've chosen uh, this experiment, and we've repeated this experiment multiple times, and see virtually the same result. And what we're basically able to infer from this is when people make these kinds of risk-benefit trade-offs, which are not uncommon in the sustainability space, people aren't necessarily looking for the ratio between cost and benefit. They're looking for other cues that help them make this choice. And in this case, the cue is, I don't want to be too aggressive and crazy on the one hand. I don't want to be too passive and non-aggressive on the other hand. I want to be somewhere in the middle. So we can actually use techniques like this to manipulate choices, which is really what a lot of people who work in choice architecture do, nudging. Or we can take the approach that I take, which is to find ways to get people to think more carefully about the ratios and the trade-offs that they really want to make. Another example of cognitive limitations is emotional impulses. We can't live without emotion. It's a, it's a key component of what makes us human. This was an experiment by Shivan Fedorkin, and they basically had students remember a number. In one case, let's say the number was 14, for example, and they were asked to go on a bit of a, a tour of their campus holding this number in their minds. It was a relatively lengthy tour. When they got to the end of the tour, they were asked to report that number to someone that they reported into at the end. If they were correct in reporting the right number, they would get a reward of either a bowl of fruit salad or chocolate cake. And I think we could all agree that fruit salad is the healthier option here. And in fact, the majority of people who went through and did this experiment picked the fruit salad. Another group of participants in the same study was asked to remember a different number, a much larger number, a more complicated number, one that's harder to remember. It required more cognitive effort to remember that number. They won the same tour. They got to the end. They were asked to report the number. If they reported it correctly, they also got to choose between a fruit salad reward or a chocolate cake reward. And here, the vast majority of people choose chocolate cake. And the purpose of this study is to illustrate that when your cognitive processing resources are limited, which they often are when we have to make trade-offs, certainly in the sustainability space, we tend to fall back, if we're not reminded to not fall back on them, we tend to fall back upon these emotional impulses. So emotions begin to come in and crowd out some more deliberative ways of thinking, which is kind of what we want to see happening when people are making difficult trade-offs in the first place. Another example of emotional impulses, this is really neat work by Paul Slovic at Decision Research. Erica mentioned it's one of the, the places where I spend a little bit of my time. 
Here it was a hypothetical case put toward people in the city of Eugene. Basically the scenario was the Eugene airport was going to buy some safety equipment that would be used in the event of, a, of an airline crash. The typical number of, uh, of injuries or fatalities in an airline crash would be around 150. And if you invested in this equipment, it would pretty much guarantee that 150 lives would be saved in the case of an accident. So this was a fail-safe to really save lives in the event of an accident. And people were asked, how much do they support on a 15-point scale the purchase of this equipment? And I think we would all agree, just at the outset, that saving 150 people is a, is a good thing. In another version of the experiment, Paul asked people this version of the experiment, and that was that if the equipment was used, you would save 98% of 150 people and ask people for their same support level. And he asked this in a variety of different ways. And I won't uh, belabor the, the drama here. I'll cut right to the chase. Here's the support level for 150 lives, around 10 out of 15. And here's the support level for 98% of 150 lives, 95%, 90%, and 85%. So what's happening here is your emotions are looking for cues that help you decide what is a good deal in this case. And the problem with human lives, even though we agree that they're important, we don't think in a currency of human lives. When we go to the shopping uh, center, when we spend our time in recreation, we don't think in terms of human well-being cur uh, currency or human life currency. We think in terms of other currencies. We think in terms of money or percent gains. And what happens here is we have a very strong positive emotional impulse attached to 98% or 95% or even 90%. Imagine saving that much money if you bought a car or laundry detergent. That would be a really fantastic deal giving someone a raw price wouldn't compute in the same way. So here people are reacting to cues that are steering their decisions in non-optimal ways. And once again, these are things that we need to think about if we're really trying to help people structure sustainability decisions at the business sustainability nexus. So there's been a ton of work. I could keep going on uh, uh, about this when I teach my class at the University of Michigan. We spend a whole term talking about this kind of stuff. The point is a lot of people are doing this kind of work. I'm certainly not alone and there's been a lot of very popular books that you go to the bookstore or the library and pick up and read more about these kinds of things. And it's fascinating stuff, it's interesting, but a lot of these books stop short in actually telling us what we need to do if we want to improve our decision making capabilities. And that's where I think the work of my group comes in specifically when we think about sustainability and the interface between business and sustainability. So, I'm all about how we can overcome cognitive limitations when we're trying to make triple bottom line decisions. And there's a few different ways that we can approach this. Here's the common narrative, and I hear this an awful lot in business, which is if you want to make better sustainability decisions, we need to give people better, higher quality information. And often it's going to be scientific information. We talk a lot and hear a lot about science-based decision making. And I'm not here to argue that that's a bad idea. Of course, more information is better than less. And we've done a number of studies that illustrate that the more information and the more knowledge people have about, for example, climate change, the more willing and able they are to make complex trade-offs about strategies and policies or business actions that would ameliorate that risk in the future. The other thing we hear about a lot is engagement, that if we want to make better decisions, we need to engage with stakeholders, with our consumers, with our customers, with other companies, with regulators, and through that process, we'll learn more and make better choices. And once again, who's going to argue that less engagement is better than more engagement? Of course we want to engage. But if that's all we do, it's not enough. I think we need to take a step past that because none of that engagement, none of that information is really going to solve the cognitive limitations that we talked about before. So I add to this list a couple of other recommendations. One is to bring what we call the reflexive system into better balance with what we call the reflective system. In other words, when we think, we want to better balance reason and emotion. We want to make those two pieces work hand in glove. A great example of this was work by Christopher C. at the University of Chicago. He presented people with ice cream. In one situation, people were presented with ice cream cup A, which was about 240 milliliters of ice cream in a 300 milliliter cup. So you can see that the ice cream doesn't quite hit the top of the cup. Another group of customers at an ice cream shop only saw cup B. This was 200 mils uh, of ice cream in a 150 milliliter cup. So the ice cream is above the cup and flowing over the sides. And he basically asked customers how much they'd be willing to pay if they pres were presented with either cup A or cup B. And as you might imagine, the willingness to pay for cup B exceeds the willingness to pay for cup A. 
Why is that? Well, when you look at this, there are two pieces of information that your mind can use. One is the relative amount of ice cream to cup size. So an emotional reaction to, am I getting an underfilled cup or an overfilled cup? Or the absolute amount of ice cream. I used to work in an ice cream shop. I am no expert on ice cream. I can't price ice cream by the scoop or by the milliliter. So even for me, this would be really hard. So I would fall back not on how much ice cream I was getting, but what the deal looked like relative to the cup size. That explains this particular result. To a third group of respondents, Christopher C. presented both cups side by side, had people choose their preferred cup and indicate a price for both. And what we see is a reversal. Now we see people recognizing that, aha, uh -huh, cup A has more ice cream. That's the one I'd want. I'd pay a little bit more for that than for the, under, or for the overfilled but lesser absolute amount of ice cream in the cup. And that makes perfect sense. And this is a great example of bringing into balance our instinctive emotional reactions and our more deliberative and deliberate reasoning abilities. Now there's a problem with this, and that is that for a lot of situations that we deal with, emotion becomes really powerful. Cass Sunstein, who was the former director of the Office of uh, uh, Information and Regulatory Affairs at the White House, works on terrorism and infrastructure. And he argues that even though the risks coming from infrastructure are much higher in terms of a public health risk, the emotional attachment that we have to terrorism is something that we want to uh, eradicate is much stronger in spite of the fact that the relative risk to the average American from terrorism is really small. So we've got a situation there where we have to balance our emotional reaction to something that's relatively low risk, although heinous, terrorism, with something that's much higher risk but not quite as emotionally active in our minds on a day-to-day -day basis. Robin Wilson at The Ohio State University and I worked on something similar. We compared people's reactions to crime in national parks or state parks with something like deer overpopulation in state parks. And here, crime, very emotionally engaging, even though it's relatively low risk. Something like deer overpopulation here, especially in the Midwest, uh, not as emotionally engaging for most people, but a much higher relative risk to public health. And to use the ice cream analogy, if you look at terrorism versus infrastructure, you could imagine crumbling infrastructure being the underfilled cup of ice cream, but more ice cream, so a higher risk, but not as emotionally appealing. Terrorism would be the overfilled cup of ice cream. And what we see is when you get people to think about them separately, of course, terrorism garners most of people's attention and support. If you put them side by side, according to Christopher C., you might expect the opposite reaction. Now you would be able to put the risks into comparison and recognize that, aha, I really should be investing in infrastructure because that's where most people are going to suffer. But in fact, that doesn't happen. People stick with terrorism as the place they want to spend most of their resources. In the case of crime and deer, it's the exact same situation. It doesn't matter how high the risks are. Our emotional aversion to the context is so powerful that we have a hard time unpacking that from how we would evaluate the data. So overcoming cognitive limitations in the case of ice cream, balancing uh, emotions and reasoning, pretty easy. As the context become more significant, that balance becomes much more difficult. So what we need to do is add another element to our overcoming cognitive limitations menu, and that is really being much more careful and explicit about thinking about our objectives. What is it that we want to achieve with our decisions, specifically in the sustainability space? What metrics are we going to use to know if we're actually achieving or not achieving our sustainability goals? And then the need to be much more careful about how we approach those trade-offs, all of this with what we call internal consistency in mind. In other words, we want to make decisions that are in line with how we prioritize, in the case of sustainability, social, economic, and environmental priorities. Clearly important when we think about this, again, going back to the sustainable development goals, where we have so many things that we could be accounting for from a metric standpoint and from an objective standpoint. And incidentally, I'm not arguing that a firm needs to cover all of these. I think we're looking at the sustainable development goals across firms, but certainly the illustration of balancing economic, social, and environmental performance goals is top of mind for uh, certainly all the companies that I've dealt with. We've studied this as well. We've worked with a lot of different companies. This is work with, uh, with some utilities on how people, their customers, would want to see a utility transition from, say, fossil-based fuels to renewable coal to something like wind or solar. We presented people with a series of, of different alternatives that they could look at. Portfolio one through six are different mixes of, of energy. 
On the left side of this table, you're looking at the different parameters that people could be looking at. How much would it cost? What would the greenhouse gas emissions be? What would the particulate matter emissions be? And so forth. And basically, we asked people to look very carefully <laughs> at a menu like this, take on board as much of that information as they could, and just order from most to least preferred those different energy mixes as what they would like to see that company actually deploy going forward, say, over the next 20 or 30 years. And what you see for any individual really is a preference order that might look like this. Portfolio two, preferred to four, which is preferred to portfolio three, portfolio five and fourth position, and then one and six. So most preferred on the left-hand side of this figure, least preferred on the right. Fair enough. That's how we often do it. That's how we vote. That's how we make decisions at the grocery store. We look, we evaluate, we indicate a preference. What we did next was we took people back to this matrix and didn't ask them to look at the portfolios and choose their preferred portfolio. We instead asked them to prioritize the different attributes. How important relative to greenhouse gas emissions was cost? How, relative, how important relative to particulate matter emissions were greenhouse gas emissions and so on? So we elicited what we call weights across all of these parameters. And on the right hand side of this figure you see how for one individual those weights shook out. Most of their priority was placed on cost, the second most on job creation, the third most on reducing greenhouse gas emissions, fourth for particulate matter emissions, fifth for reducing the land use impact of energy transitions, and then lastly, doing something that was perceived as being very innovative. What we can do now is take those weights, plug them into a model, and come up with a preference order that reflects exactly that set of priorities for that particular individual. Now, if we're perfectly calibrated as people, how we take on board information in a matrix like the one I just showed you should lead to decisions or preference orders that are identical to preference orders that come from a more attribute-specific weighting approach. And this is actually a fundamental assumption of a lot of modern uh, economics. What we find instead in the case of energy, but across basically every context we've studied from your retirement portfolio to how you buy a cell phone to where you live to how you buy a car to what you want to see happen in Syria, we've studied all of those contexts and what we see is this. Complete shifts in preference orders. You make one set of preference orders when you evaluate information holistically. You make a completely different set of preference orders when you think about what's important to you and how what's important to you affects what it is that you actually want to see. And I think this really more than anything is the problem that's at the heart of the contemporary business and sustainability narrative. The fact that we say we want to achieve certain things yet our decisions don't always reflect those priorities. It's not because we're bad people, it's not because we don't care, it's simply because there's a lot of cognitive machinery that we have to deal with and overcome in order to, make, in order to be able to make preferences in the way that we would like to think that we are able to make them. What we are then, in effect, is archaeologists. There is an assumption that when it comes to choices and preferences that they exist in there. We're presented with a scenario where we have to make a choice or indicate a preference and all we do is refer to our file system of priorities and dig up a preference and show it to you just the same way an archaeologist would dig up a relic and present it to you. And I'm here to tell you that we are not archaeologists. What we are instead are architects. We are taking information from the environment around, the, uh, around us. We are smashing that into our values and we are doing the best we possibly can in the moment to make decisions that we think or believe are internally consistent. In other words, decisions that are in line with our priorities. But like any good architect, you need a building code. So in other words, if you do it instinctively, we're going to run into a lot of the problems that we ran in to in the experiments that we've done. If we start introducing a building code for these kinds of decisions, we argue in my research group that you can actually begin to make better, more internally consistent, triple bottom line decisions. And that's what I want to talk about in the last little bit of my presentation here. The building code. It looks something like this in our minds. This is one version of it. Different practitioners of the triple bottom line, the way that we think about it, adopt slightly different building codes. But really, it comes down to five key elements. The first thing is to really understand what the problem or opportunity is that you're confronting as a sustainability professional. What is it that you actually want to achieve as an end result of the decisions that you're about to make? 
Secondly, you want to think very carefully about your goals and objectives. Where do you want to go with that decision? And importantly, how are you going to measure performance? How are you going to know if you're succeeding or failing? There's that famous quote of not being able to know where you're going if you don't have a map to get you there. So these objectives and metrics sort of perform the function of that roadmap. You then want to be able to create alternatives in a creative, systematic, and comprehensive way. We don't want to look at some alternatives at the expense of others. We want to be as broad in our thinking about what our options are as possible. We want to forecast the consequences of those alternatives in terms of how well or how not well we think they're going to help us achieve our objectives. And we're going to want to be very explicit about uncertainties as we go through that. And then lastly, we're going to want to set priorities and make trade-offs before we ultimately choose. So a lot of the kinds of elements that I've talked about in the presentation so far. An example of this was work that we did actually with another university. This was work with Michigan State University that was looking at decommissioning a coal-fired power facility on campus. Really they were looking to transition to something that was more renewable at the same time, really trying to uh, treat it as a triple bottom line scenario. So environmental benefit, social benefit, but also economic benefits. It would have to make economic sense. So the first step in all of this was really to define the problem space, the opportunity space we were working in. Some of the key things that we uh, uncovered is that you know, when you're dealing with energy systems as a sustainability example, you really need to meet demand. You can't build something if it's not going to meet your customer's demand. And in this particular case, it was demands for both thermal and electrical energy. We had to generate enough electricity to power the university and the surrounding communities, and we had to generate enough heat in order for the university to, to operate under its sort of current heating and cooling systems. It had to be multi-party, it had to be interdisciplinary, so we really began to map out what this problem space would look like. The second step in the process was to really understand, according to our, uh, our building code, what different stakeholders' objectives were in a decision like this. And to do that, this was about a year of work by a PhD student in this particular case who went out meeting with stakeholder after stakeholder to build maps of what we call means and ends objectives. Things that were fundamentally important to different stakeholders, they fall down the mid middle column of that graph on the right, and means to those ends, objectives that were instrumental in helping us get to ultimately re where we want to go from a triple bottom line standpoint. And over the course of dozens of meetings with different stakeholders, nine different objectives really rose to the top as being broadly accepted as important across all the groups. Meeting demand, being efficient, increasing the renewable fraction, minimizing costs, creating jobs, reducing emissions, uh, reducing air pollution, and then doing things that were perceived to be, in this case, innovative. And you can see where that first experiment that I talked about a few minutes ago actually came from. It came from this particular experience that we had. We worked with a consultant out in Vancouver, British Columbia that does some work on decision support. They were able to help build a, an automated online framework that different stakeholders could use to develop their own energy portfolios that were efficient, that met the different uh, fuel kinds of constraints that we would be operating under, different power plant options, different decentralized energy options, different grid options. We could see whether or not the mixes people were building would meet demand as we indicated in our problem scope. And then we could see how whatever portfolio they were building would actually help them meet or not meet different objectives. And I'll play this through for a little while. This is a video of someone actually using the tool as they increase the energy efficiency levels. They start building a power plant with different fuel sources, moving to renewables. And as they're doing all of this, you're seeing on the lower left whether or not they're meeting demand. And on the lower right, how the different portfolios that they're building are actually helping them to meet the different objective targets that were set at the beginning of the process. Now here's the thing. If you ask a lay person, a customer of a utility, to build an energy system, you might not expect the most efficient or the most robust energy system. We weren't doing this to actually elicit from people what kind of energy system we would actually build. What we were doing was using this tool to educate people about how energy systems work. Because ultimately what we wanted from people was a set of internally consistent preferences. And as we said earlier on, one of the first steps in decision quality is getting people good information, getting them knowledgeable enough about the context to be able to make a smart triple bottom line choice. So all of this was to help them learn about systems. And if we were able to glean from this some models of energy systems that would work, that was a bonus as far as we were concerned.
What we then did, according to the same kinds of experiments I talked about earlier, was we elicited weights on different priorities from each individual stakeholder group, and in many cases, each individual stakeholder, and were able to translate those weights into preference orders. So we could then go back to people and show them among the different portfolios that they could consider, including the one that they themselves built. It's the one bar on the far right of your screen was a user-generated portfolio. Option two and option three were portfolios that were presented to people. We could then show them according to which priorities they set, which alternatives would perform the best. Now we didn't then say, and now you must choose the one that performs the best. All we said was, Here's a spectrum of alternatives. These are the ones that perform the best. These are the ones that perform the worst. Now it's up to you to decide which one you would like to see, in this case, the utility implement. So it was really a tool not to come up with an answer. It was a tool for facilitating a dialogue that would lead organizations working with their stakeholders to come up with an answer that made sense to the most people. We did a bunch of evaluation of a tool like this. We've used other tools like this in other contexts. And they work extraordinarily well. They lead people in the direction of more internally as compared to less internally consistent preferences, which is what we want when we talk about the triple bottom line. And it makes them happy. They understand what's going on. They feel like they're learning more. They feel great levels of satisfaction. And importantly, they're much more willing to go along with decisions that are the product of a decision like this than ones that are made in a more holistic and perhaps intuitive fashion. So the analogy that I use for my students when I talk about this stuff is when it comes to sustainability, we're basically playing Moneyball. We are going through and looking at a whole bunch of alternatives that we could consider that we used to consider in a very intuitive and haphazard way that was contaminated by all kinds of biases, all kinds of emotional reactions. And we're trying to get to a place where we can make science-based decisions that at the same time align better with our priorities. In the case of Moneyball, you want to win games. In the case of business and sustainability, we want to make big sustainability inroads. And the way we think we can get there is by actually adding some much needed structure to the kinds of decisions that we're trying to make. So let me um, wrap up with some conclusions. I've spoken today about a few different approaches to the triple bottom line, accounting and reporting, this idea of benchmarking, and then lastly, strategic decision making. I want to say, as I wrap up, that all three are valuable. As I said at the beginning of the talk, you really can't do level three without level two, and you can't do level two without level one. So I really see this as a system. But I would remind you that if market transformation is really the goal of a transition towards sustainability in business, then I think we need to start thinking and recognizing that more strategic shifts in how we as firms make decisions is going to be absolutely critical. I'll also conclude by reminding you that the tools that we talk about, the approaches that we talk about for sort of helping to foster more internally consistent triple bottom line decisions are not intended, at least by us, to give you the answer. We're not here to tell you what to do or how to think. What we're here to do instead is to facilitate a well-structured dialogue and well-structured deliberation. We want to help you approach what is in, intuitive, in an intuitive sense, a very complex problem with some tools that decompose that complexity into more cognitively manageable parts that you could systematically work through. So dialogue and deliberation are the goals, as are things like debiasing and, importantly, helping us to question what are often unquestioned assumptions about what we care about or what we think sustainability is. Third, these tools are really there to help us balance social, environmental, and economic performance. Really, for us, the name of the game is trade-offs. I know that's a loaded word. People don't like talking about trade-offs, especially in the sustainability space, because it implies giving something up to get something else. But nevertheless, when we think about sustainability of the long term, that really is what we're doing. We are giving up something we value at time A in exchange for something that we value maybe at time B for different reasons. And I think we just have to be honest with ourselves that those kinds of decisions are hard and we often need help in making them. And then lastly, the takeaway should be these approaches are about structure, not necessarily about technology. So I showed you a framework that was all about computerization, automation, to get people to make decisions in a systematic and internally consistent way. We've also done work in this case with a philanthropist in East Africa on water sanitation with local Maasai people in very remote villages where we took the exact same approaches 
but didn't automate them. We had conversations, we set priorities through dialogue, we did a lot of drawing and ranking using jelly beans. We basically did that to get people to think about the problem that they were confronting, water sanitation, what their objectives were as people on the environmental, social and economic sides. We got them thinking about a range of different alternatives which they forecasted performance for and then led them through a process of thinking through the trade-offs. Some systems were really great, but really expensive. Really great in terms of sanitation, really expensive in terms of cost. Others were really great in terms of environmental footprint, but really expensive and not as effective socially. So how would we balance those situations in coming up with a sanitation framework that worked in these villages? I promise you no software, no computers, nothing but conversation, and it worked just as well in this situation as our automated tools work in the more, um, uh, let's say, sophisticated Western settings like energy transitions. So ultimately, I'll end off by saying that the triple bottom line is really a balancing act. It's uh, about social, environmental, and economic priorities coming into balance with one another over time. Going back to the accounting and reporting ideas, of course we can make progress across all three. I think when we talk about the wins, the three wins, the win-win-win perspective, we're looking at ways to, in the case of business, be profitable and, and survive as a, as a company. We're looking at ways to be environmentally sustainable and we're looking for ways to be socially progressive and we're looking to move the needle on all three fronts all the time. That's a given. But what we can't do at any one point in time is maximize across all three. We can't be maximally profitable, maximally environmentally sustainable, and maximally socially progressive. At any point in time we have to dial some back and dial other ones up and how we dial those back and up really depends on the, the timing of the decisions that we're making. So with that I would remind everyone who's watching that when it comes to making these kinds of trade-offs we shouldn't all be considered equal. Some of us are able to make different trade-offs than others so in other words my triple bottom line is going to be different from your triple bottom line and that should be totally okay. We shouldn't judge each other by how far advanced my company is as compared to your company as long as we're all heading in the right direction. And secondly, because there's a, a strong temporal element here, my triple bottom line today isn't going to be the same as my triple bottom line yesterday or as my triple bottom line is going to be tomorrow. My ability to make trade-offs is going to be different depending upon my financial position, my social position, or my environmental position. We have to be explicit about that as well. And really this boils down to the fact that people, by their very nature, are adaptive decision makers. We don't make the same decision in our lives over and over and over again. If we did, we would never evolve as people or as a society. So we have to allow for that kind of transition to occur, not only in the sustainability system that we're working in, but also in ourselves. And then lastly, if we take all these pieces and pull, to, pull them together, we can actually move in the direction of what we call adaptive management, where we learn from our experiences in the past by being strategic and build those into decisions that we want to make in the future, all in the name of those three Ps that Elkington started us off on at the very beginning of the presentation today. With that, uh, let me thank you for your attention. Let me wish you all a happy Earth Week, and I'd be happy to take some questions from Erica. Thank you, Joy, for such an insightful lecture and for reminding us how lousy we are at making decisions. Um, so that's a question that I have for you in regards, you know, we are trying uh, to influence people every single day and especially when it comes to sustainability, we're looking for those cross-functional, uh, across geography support. So how do you help, how, what do you recommend us to be able to influence people knowing that we often run on autopilot and don't really make good decisions when we are in that state? That's a, that's a really fantastic question I, and I love the autopilot uh, analogy. You know, I think that the first step is really one of education. Um, and you know, I talk about this in my, in my day job at the university where in order to be a, a better decision maker, I think you need to be aware of what it is you're up against cognitively and contextually when you make these kinds of choices. So anything that we can do that alerts people to the kinds of challenges that they confront or are about to confront uh, would help. Secondly, I think organizations, when we talk about businesses or governments or different nonprofits, it doesn't really matter. 
I think they really need to build capacity internally. I think that if you look at a, a company like Dow or General Motors or Ford, there's a lot of different functional areas in there where the needle is always moving in terms of progress. It's progress on the, on the chemistry side, it's on the manufacturing side, it's on the innovation side. There needs to be just as much progress on the decision-making side. Just like you have marketers and economists, I think building capacity on the decision-making side to bring your people uh, into the conversation about decision-making in a more meaningful way is, is absolutely crucial. I'm happy to hear that because um, often we see more and more the topic of unconscious bias being brought forward for all types of decisions and to take that lens out of how we see the world so we have a more holistic view of it. So when it comes to the trade-offs of the triple bottom line decisions, uh, is there a place for our emotions to be involved or should we just be like super hmm. mechanic and objective? It's another great question, and, and in fact, it's one of the questions that my students always ask me. They sort of accuse me of arguing toward the end of my class that we're trying to sort of pull emotion out of the equation. And that, that's far from the truth. In fact, uh, it really is about this balance between our emotional responses and our more reasoned, deliberative, cognitive responses. Let me give you an example of this. If you're thinking about sustainability and you're trying to do something that's progressive on the environmental side or the social side, uh, or even the economic side for that matter, if you don't allow emotion to be a part of that process, how do you know what you like? How do you know what level of performance is going to be good enough? How do you know which level of performance is going to be satisfactory, that's going to be engaging or inspiring? So emotion absolutely has to be involved. Um, otherwise, we really couldn't be effective decision makers. What I'm arguing is that uh, emotion and cognition need to be tempered. They need to be introduced at the right levels. It's kind of like baking bread. You need all the ingredients in there at the right level for that bread to rise uh, and be something that you would actually want to eat later on. Excellent. And when it comes to trade-offs, we are living with them every single day. Yet, we don't like making those trade-offs. Why is it? You, you know, I, this, is, um, this is something that a lot of people are studying. We live with social, economic, environmental, so the consequences of those trade-offs on a, on a daily basis. And we're actually really effective at living with those trade-offs uh, when they're made by others on our behalf. I'm not going to suggest that we're always happy about the balance, but we find a way to live through them. And you could take any point in our history uh, and look at something as controversial as politics to understand that. Sometimes people are happy, sometimes people are upset, uh, but by and large, people get up in the morning, they put their pants on one leg at a time, and they proceed through uh, their days. Ask someone to make those trade-offs themselves, and it's a different ballgame altogether. And what happens is that we feel like we're violating our own personal moral code. So if I have to suddenly give up something, let's say, environmental performance in exchange for job creation, that creates a moral conflict in me uh, that's not consistent with how I view myself from the outside. So oftentimes my first reaction to a decision like that is simply going to be to say, I'm not going to make it. I refuse to make a decision like that. What that leads to is a lot of status quo thinking. So I think um, a lot of the tools that we talk about are really intended to break through that kind of uh, uh, di difficulty in, in, in confronting those trade-offs so that we can take more control over the trade-offs that we're willing and unwilling to make and not just, not just be uh, by necessity uh, uh, at the mercy of others making those decisions on our behalf. I really love when you talked about my triple bottom line, my no be your triple bottom line, but as long as we are going towards the same direction, we can work together. And many, uh, I mean, some sustainability professionals really bristle at the idea of having trade-offs between, you know, the social and the environmental and economic concerns. You know, they talk about having to move the three gains together so how do you reconcile your approach, which makes these trade-offs explicit, um, with the idea that we can't afford to trade some, some values for others? That's another really good question. I, I think about this in terms of, of time. So I think that when we make um, our decisions today, we need to be cognizant of the trade-offs that we're willing to make. Um, so for me, that's the point about being explicit. We need to really be in the moment with our decisions, understanding the, understanding the environment in which our choices are being made, understanding the constraints that are uh, imposed upon us by the external and internal environments that really dictate the degree to which we can and cannot make certain kinds of trade-offs. That needs to be top of mind at the moment of 
uh, strategic decision making for sustainability. Over the long term, we're making gains across all three. So at time point one, in the moment, we might say we're going to leave a little bit of money on the table in order to be more sustainable as a firm. Or at this point in our evolution as a company, as a startup, for example, we can't afford to bleed capital. So we're going to make some trade-offs that maybe prioritize economic survival in exchange for maybe social progress, uh, recognizing that over time we're going to readjust that. Uh, balance. So I think that's where the trade-off conversation comes in. And I think we're kidding ourselves if we don't uh, acknowledge the fact that we have to make those trade-offs as firms. Over a year, five years, 10 years, 15, 20, the survival of our company, that's where we can make gains across all three. We look at the long game. So the analogy that I'd use for my students is, you know, when you're standing on the earth, uh, it's flat. That's the trade-off piece. When you're viewing it from space, it's round. That's the gains on all three front space. So I think these aren't mutually exclusive, but they really ought to be uh, informing one another. At the beginning of your lecture, you were mentioning about a retrospective look of your performance as a narrative for sustainability versus making sustainability a strategic decision to move the company, co any company or any business forward. So if a company wanted to ramp up in the way that you are describing, what will they need to do? I alluded to this in one of your, your earlier questions. You know, I've, I've gone around from company to company giving, giving talks like this, and really I make the recommendation at the end that the kinds of um, decisions that we're being asked to make as companies, whether they're in the sustainability space or not, are becoming increasingly con uh, complex. Multiple objectives, lots of different conflicting metrics, lots of different possible courses of action. And what a lot of firms do, and in fact a lot of uh, government agencies and nonprofits do, is basically rely on what I think is a tired narrative of the room is full of educated, smart, experienced people who when you put them together magic will happen and they'll make internally consistent decisions. We've shown time and time again in our research that that's actually not the case. So what I argue for is just like you have an R&D group at a company like uh, General Motors on mobility or in Dow on chemistry, just like you have a marketing department that's trying to message in ways that capture people's attention, just like you have an economics uh, office that's really trying to understand the costs and benefits of doing business, you really ought to start to invest in internal decision support. Branches within your organization that are there to help leaders, managers, employees make decisions that are internally consistent. That includes education, that includes continuing education and training, and then ultimately for some firms that I've worked with, it involves uh, a presence in the boardroom when big strategic decisions are being made. Some companies have done this. Uh, I don't think I should discuss who they are, uh, but they have these people in the room that are there to shadow the C-suite to help them think through some of these really complicated decisions. Ultimately, uh, my dream is to see that become more mainstream across all companies. Yeah, definitely it's important for us to be more intentional about the decisions. Sometimes we just get too busy with our day-to-day -day task and we forget to see a big picture and be more strategic about what we do. So that's an invitation for everybody uh, to think more about what we decide every day. So are there any examples of organizations that have adopted any, ap any of these approaches or examples of the tools uh, that you outlined? outlined today. Yeah, absolutely. So without, without naming the companies themselves, uh, you know, I've done work with a, a, an energy utility uh, in the Pacific Northwest that has basically adopted an internal rule that any decision that's going to cost the company more than X is going to go through the kind of triple bottom line analysis that we talked about today. And they've built a, an entire division within the utility that's there expressly uh, for that purpose. Uh, I've worked with a, a bank in Australia that's looking at using these kinds of tools to help investors, both on the private banking side, but also just their day-to-day -day clients making retirement portfolio decisions, not just go through a risk profile and then have uh, uh, passive uh, management take place where uh, uh, allocations of their resources are being made for them, where they're actually in the room helping to decide how to allocate resources so that they're investing in uh, companies, uh, in portfolios that uh, reflect their own values as, a, as individual uh, investors, th uh, taking into consideration the sustainability uh, objectives that we talked about uh, uh, today. I've worked with government agencies. Uh, here are ones that I can talk about. Um, Fish and Wildlife Service uh, 
uh, when they make endangerment decisions around endangered species management, when they make a lot of restoration decisions, are incorporating what we call structured decision making into their day-to-day -day operations. There are people who are trained in this whose sole job is to do this at the government level. So you're seeing this sort of becoming slowly more widely adopted, but I, I would say that it's not quite made, m mainstream, um, but I certainly keep my fingers crossed that it will be one day. Joe, it's always such a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you for joining us for another Elements of Sustainability series. Please remember to be very mindful of the limitations of human cognition. Until the next one.